uh, uh, strategy of Belgium. The question is, did Belgium design any hospitals as COVID-19 hospitals? And what was the economic impact of the healthcare system in general? How much infrastructure was transferred to these institutions, to the institutions designed for to be COVID-19 hospitals? At first, there were only two hospitals that were considered as references for COVID patients. It was St. Peter at Brussels and uh, the ZA at Antwerp. I know that St. Peter's asked for funds at one moment because they, did, they didn't have enough ventilators and they received 4 million euros to modify some of their wards. Personally received 1 million euro and all of it was used for the modification of the infrastructures. Uh, as I have to remind it, we modified seven wards for COVID patients and most of, the, most of them were in isolated rooms. We didn't court them because we had the luxury of keeping them in isolated, in isolated chambers. Um, personally, in hospitals, we have 99 ventilators, so we didn't need to buy any. We have a huge stock of it, and in comparison to other hospitals, we never were saturated for the ventilators. That's one aspect of it. We received 70% of the COVID patients were transfers from general hospitals. And very quickly in Belgium, St. Pierre and UZR were saturated with patients. And the government asked for all general hospitals to treat COVID patients. That's why many, many hospitals never were saturated with COVID patients. Most of all, the, the maximum we saw in Belgium was 90% of occupation rate. The mm. problem is that in some hospitals, there were very light patients in, in intensive care beds. As I said, in no hospital, 90% of those patients were intubated and ventilated. It wasn't patients with only a, a mask of oxygen. There were six of them on ECMOs, and I think that other university or academic hospitals were in the same problematic as us with an heavy weight of patients. That's why, and uh, I saw the, the other question with uh, the, the tiredness of the, of the staff. It's really, really problematic because right now we want to do more activities, more elective activities, and we're limited because most nurses, many nurses, are in that tiredness step. We kept them at home so they can recover all the supplementary hours but it's not enough. And as I showed, the long-term absenteeism is once more creeping back. And every day we have five to six nurses that are absent. And it's the same problem in the, in the, in the, in the intensive care unit because one ward is kept closed because we don't have any nurses there. So we have to stop some elective surgery that had to go to the ICU as pancreatectomy, esophagectomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the, que uh, for the answers. Um, maybe we have one more question for you. Uh, the second one is already answered. Uh, this is about this, a possible second wave. If we will have a second wave, uh, what are the lessons that you could use in the management of the patients, especially of the cardiothoracic vascular uh, surgery patients? We went on, we went on with uh, thoracic surgeries, mainly oncologic, thoracotomies, thoracoscopies, with uh, lung resection, tumorectomies, and uh, we never stopped operating those oncologic thoracic patients. In comparison, I think that we were a little light on the cardiovascular operations, mainly vascular interventions. The thrombodactomy of carotid arteries that weren't done, they were cancelled, and I think it was a mistake because those patients needed to be operated very quickly. On the cardiac side, we went on with coronary biographs, but... Uh, for the, uh, for the valvular pathologies, 
we we didn't do enough and i think that it was also a mistake and for the second wave we wouldn't stop those activities Thank you very much uh, the next question is uh, for uh, dr alexander waba uh, and the question is about whether there are any studies uh, showing an increased fatality rate due to myocardial issues and if yes was is because of uh, people have decided not to go to the OR, not to get operated. Thank you very much for your question. Now, I don't have any uh, information from Norway, from our units. I can tell you that, as, uh, as several of the speakers said, that there is a general tendency that was seen that less people with a myocardial infarction would come to hospital. Well, if you sort of take it from a logical point of view, you would say that would uh, mean that uh, there's a high risk that many patients came to the hospital too late and that you would expect an increase in the fatality rate. And actually, there, I, I think it's it's not so easy to, uh, to analyze this uh, at this stage very easily. But uh, I've seen studies that showed that in Italy, less people were attending hospital with myocardial infarction and that the uh, fatality rate of those who came into hospital was higher than usual but it's it's maybe not so easy to um, to investigate that because you have to divide covid uh, deaths from normal myocardial infarction but as i said there is an indication that this actually happened that more people died because they didn't come to hospital early enough okay thank you very much there are okay. some other questions uh, namely for Dr. Brunelli, you spoke about the high toll rate, death toll in uh, in the UK. Yeah? There were equally very high uh, death tolls in uh, in Italy. It was the first country with such a high death toll. But uh, pro capita in Belgium, there is uh, really a catastrophic situation. So. Uh, anyone or uh, all of you, I mean, uh, Turgai, Steph, uh, Fabio, uh, Alessandro, could you comment this, uh, this uh, issue, please? Well, well, I cannot comment for Belgium. I, I don't know what happened in Belgium um, uh, in tra and how they measure or classify um, uh, death from COVID. I can, I can comment, you know, what happened in, here in, uh, in, in UK. Um, I, I think, I think uh, everyone here, I think that the um, 40,000 dead are probably an underestimation of what um, uh, has, you know, really happened. You know, initially there was, um, um, they, they were counting only death uh, in in hospital um, because there was there was no testing at all um, so they were testing only patients in ICU or you know uh, in a hospital then gradually the testing increased and they started to test uh, to to you know um, count also the um, patient dying. Uh, in the um, in the nursing care, uh, in the um, outside the hospital, and that that was you know that that you know brought the um, the total number very high, but um, um, the, the, I think this doesn't still account for all the uh, death that are um, people that are not tested were not tested, but. Um, who die with the uh, um, COVID-like uh, symptoms, and sometimes you know they are even uh, classified in the in the um, cause of death, but they're um, um, so in the social registry uh, as COVID, although not COVID tested. What happened here? I don't know. Uh, the probably the lockdown measures, um, and there is a lot of criticism here in in UK. The lockdown measures started late despite the fact that everyone here knew already what was happening in the in Europe in other countries 
uh, and is in southern Europe, um, and um, and probably this this uh, explain the high number of death, uh, especially in the initial phase. Um, there is, I must say, a different uh, uh, cultural um, way of um, uh, dealing with with uh, death uh, in 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 UK, um, and I can speak by experience. You know, having worked in the two systems, uh, the ICU beds here were never saturated, never reached. Um, um, you know, full capacity, um, uh, despite the high number of cases, because because most of the patient never never arrived to ICU. You know, with the all the DNR and uh, do not resuscitate, and so patient elderly patient with multiple comorbidities, uh, they were basically already had a DNR in place, uh, and this happens. This happens already in in the culture here you know um compared to uh compared per, for for instance in the southern of europe where where um uh, this is is less uh prominent you know and and, uh, and there is a different way of uh, of um i don't know dealing with this or you know a different emotional way to um uh, facing the, the 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 critical critically ill patients, so I I, I think this this is one of the reason. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's di it's difficult. It's difficult. I agree um, that is very difficult now to draw conclusions. I think we need to wait the end of it and to elaborate all the data and uh, and to have a clear. Um, um, picture of what happened really in the different countries um, before draw any conclusions. Okay, thank you very much, Tour Guy. Maybe you could add something, or or Steph, or the the huge number of deaths per capita in Belgium is due, as Stefan said, to the fact that the suspected and confirmed patients. Dying were accounted for. That explains the main difference with the other countries. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a comment. I think that the only country where it's we have a known number of the death toll for the healthcare workers is Italy. In the rest of the in the other countries, we don't know anything about how many. Uh, healthcare workers died, uh, passed away in this situation. So uh, my thoughts go for for them and for their families. Uh, one question for for Steph. Steph, uh, what do you think about uh, about the the tests for for the the COVID nineteen? I mean, uh, people spoke about, uh, of course, the the. The classic uh, uh, PCR array, uh, but what do you think about the, the CT testing or something uh, else or symptomatic testing? Just so, uh, would you comment, please? Uh, we have to make we have to distinguish between asymptomatic patients and symptomatic patients. So. In symptomatic patients, I think still the gold standard, despite all the weaknesses, is PCR testing, the, the nasopharyngeal swab. So we know that there is a considerable rate of false negatives, negative tests up to 30 or 40 percent. So if you have a patient that is symptomatic and where you have so a strong suspicion that he might have COVID and for example, you also have to consider the epidemiological context. So if you have a high local incidence of COVID at the moment and the patient comes into the hospital with uh, fever and with uh, loss of uh, smell and taste sense, uh, and the COVID, the PCR test says that the patient is negative, you should certainly do a, a, a chest uh, CT. 
but in asymptomatic patients, the role of chest CT is much less um, investigated, in my opinion, also not necessary. So if you have an asymptomatic patient without any dyspnea, without any cuff, you won't see a lot on the CT, in my opinion. So the, the golden standard still is uh, PCR testing, which is the first step, and then you have this to decide further. The antibody tests uh, are still, by the respective societies, um, they, they advise against the use of antibody tests because nobody knows at this moment, um, uh, or, or the, uh, in other words, there is a lot of uh, false uh, positives in the uh, antibody tests. So it means that if you have had once a, 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 a cold, for example, in the last winter with a with a uh, undangerous uh, COVID virus or a coronavirus, then you will have antibodies which might cross react against the COVID-19 virus, so it's not sure that, about, nobody's sure about your immune status, and then you also don't know uh, which titter of antibodies you need to protect you from uh, COVID, so the, the current guidelines still advise against the use of antibody tests uh, due to the limitations of these tests. So still the PCR test is the gold standard in asymptomatic patients if the test is negative, uh, as I told you, and you have a high prevalence of COVID, then you should proceed with surgery. But with PPE, if you have a low local prevalence and you have a negative test, you can proceed with surgery um, without PPE. Thank you, Steve, for answering this question. And uh, actually, we have a lot of questions, but uh, time is running out. Uh, any unaddressed questions, we'll address them by speakers and post it on the EACTA website. I have a question for Fabio about um, what's about uh, post-operative testing. Is there any recommendation for post-operative testing for COVID-19 patients to being discharged from hospital after surgery in case of resuming elective cardiac and thoracic surgery? What do you think, Fabio? Well, Mohamed, I, um, I think this is an interesting point and this is something we are really coping with um, every day, I would say. Now, um, being um, on the same line as Steph, I think that we should distinguish between a patient who had a negative test preoperatively. In this case, you need only one negative swab to confirm that the patient is negative and you can discharge the patient. This is what we are doing routinely. Different situation is if you are uh, if you had to operate on a positive patient, maybe an aortic dissection with a positive swab, in that case, you need at least two negative um, swabs to discharge. But this is very rarely possible um, in the next two or three weeks. So this opens um, an issue for those patients who arrive to surgery uh, with a preoperative positive test, which are, I would say, 99% emergent cases or urgent cases, um, you have to plan appropriate words where these patients can be taken care of until their swabs get negative, or if they can, they have to be put on quarantine, as we all know. So it's two different scenarios. The easy one is the patient who is negative preoperatively, and you just need to confirm that the patient is negative postoperatively. And there is no reason why the patient should be positive unless some of the staff members brought the virus to the patient in the in theater or in the intensive care unit, which can happen. Uh, and of course, more challenging situation if you have to operate on a positive patient in an emergency situation, and then you have to consider this patient positive, uh, that this positive patient will be positive for a longer time after the operation. Thank you, Fabio. And I think now I leave it to Mert to give the take home message. Mert, please. Their contribution to this webinar and then uh, we can proceed with the take-home message. I think uh, this was also not the target of this webinar to give strict uh, suggestions 
when on how to resume the operation because it's changed from center to center, not only from country to country, also from city to city. So what we have here is uh, this webinar has helped us, at least helped me, to see all the factors and the scales of the balance. So on one hand, on one scale of the balance, we have, of, of course, a lot of patients waiting to be operated since months, uh, either with some carcinoma or some with cardiac failure. Moreover, again, in the same scale, we have also some financial issue that we cannot ignore, we may not ignore. But on the other scale, in fact, indeed, we have the fact that is never and nowhere um, totally possible to isolate the COVID positive and COVID negative patients. And therefore, we have to uh, do something both in the preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative periods to decrease the risks, uh, the risk for the, for, uh, to, to protect against the contagion. And therefore, we have always considered that the risk is still okay, uh, as Steph has mentioned also in this uh, editorial, the risk is not very high, but there is still a high risk for both the patient and the doctor uh, for, of a contagion. And therefore, uh, it's important to make an objective and reliable decision uh, regarding the resumption of the uh, elective operations. I think this webinar, and I hope that this webinar has helped us all uh, to give some strict suggestions about the factors that would affect our decision. And I hope that was also our target. Thank you very much. And so I give my word to our president, Fabio, please. Oh, thank you, Mert. Well, I, I fully, fully agree with Mert, with the, the take home message and his uh, conclusions. So I will only add that from the YACTA perspective, um, this, webin this webinar and webinars like this, we already had um, in 2020 and also last year, uh, belong to our educational activities, activities that the ACTA is trying to uh, push in a way that we can increase the exposure of our scientific community to interesting topics, thanks to eminent speakers like tonight we had from both the surgical and the anesthesia world. And this is this educational activity that the ACTA is trying to uh, support in, 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 uh, at, the, at its best is something that is particularly important this year when all our uh, standard activities like the ECHO course and the annual meeting uh, have been um, put in a very difficult situation like for many other societies and associations um, by the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Um, but having said this, I, I really uh, wish to, uh, and I, I have to, I really feel I have to thank the speakers who did really an excellent work um, by providing uh, clear messages on what are the most important points in this very difficult phase of resuming surgery. In, in my personal experience, this resuming phase is probably even more difficult than the pandemic one, because there are a lot of uh, tricks that we have to uh, take care of. Um, I also would like to thank MultiLearning for their excellent technical support to this webinar and to our, to other uh, IACTA um, webinars and activities. A special thank to AIM for their organizational support. AIM is a, our association uh, management company who is uh, supporting us a lot with all these uh, activities. And uh, I also am indebted as the ACTA president to Edwards for their unrestricted grant, which is supporting the ACTA in this type of activities. 
And last but not least, I, I really would like to give a special thank um, to the Educational Committee. And if I can, uh, if you allow me, a special thank to Mohamed El Tahan, who is really uh, the strong actor engine in supporting uh, all this educational activity. Um, I thank you everybody again. I thank all the people attending the webinar. Uh, we hope, we really hope that this activity um, was useful to you for your clinical uh, practice so that you can really see the impact of the information you got tonight in your resuming phase at your own places. And I really look forward to uh, meeting all you in the next uh, YACTA webinar this year. Thank you so much for your contribution. Bye-bye, everybody. Before, before closing the webinar, maybe I have to give some last two messages. First of all, all the questions that have been asked, but not uh, for the time to, to get answered, will be answered by the uh, speakers, and uh, you can, we will be able to find the answers in uh, the AACTA website, in the website of the webinar. And the second one, for certificates of attendance, uh, you can click on the banner on this page or contact the email address webinar at aimgroup.eu. That was the last two messages again, and thank you very much, and bye.